rise. Court of Appeals, Division One, is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. The time set for oral argument in our cause number CV 14-0801 involving uh, respect uh, the promise in opposition to R-1402, Neighbors for a Better Glendale, et al. versus Pam Hanna and the City of Glendale. Uh, each side will have uh, 20 minutes uh, to argue and uh, Mr. Grady, if you'd like to manage uh, the clock for rebuttal, we will allow you to do so. Um, as you come forward, please identify yourselves and your client because we are audio taping this. We're also videotaping it and we'll show up on YouTube and, uh, in the future. We have read the briefs. We've conferenced this matter. Uh, we think we understand what the issues are and with that, Mr. Grady. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning, and may it please the Court. My name is Mary O'Grady, and I represent the appellants in this matter who are the proponents of the referenda at issue in this case. This case concerns one of the most important public policy issues that the City of Glendale has confronted in recent years. The measures at issue in this case in the measures that, were, um, that are at issue here, Glendale adopted a policy of fully supporting the development of a casino on an island of a newly created reservation within the city's boundaries. And it takes steps to implement how it's going to support that development, both immediately and over the long term, both to assure that it can open expeditiously if there is going to be a casino there, and to help assure its long-term viability. Council, These, speak, speaking of implementation, mm -hmm. where, can you tell us where is the, the what is the status of the of the settlement agreement? Is it being implemented um, as we speak, or is there is it on hold because of this litigation? I mean, the, I'm talking about the the city's obligation to provide infrastructure. I mean, are there are things going on? Your Honor, I know that things are going on at the site. They are building a building out there. Um, but whether it will function as a casino, um, I don't know, and that's yet to be decided. Well, assuming and that the city actually goes ahead and spends $14 million on infrastructure between now and uh, the time when this could be placed on the election, would that, would that moot? Wouldn't that moot the referendum? Or would you, what, what would the city, what would the voters be voting on? If, your Honor, they're voting on the long-term kind of obligations that are under this agreement. And to the extent, if the city is proceeding with the implementation as, of this, despite the referendum, they're sort of doing so at their risk in terms of what happens if this goes to the ballot and the voters reject the city's decision. Uh, but, but essentially, if they reject it, then the city needs to go back to the drawing board and take it from and there. And would that include whatever happened, if the litigation is still pending at that point in time, of uh, being, being re-instituting re the litigation, or how would it? Intervening. Intervening again? Because it's my understanding they're dismissed. Or be based on the answering brief, the city has been dismissed, or has there been oh. no final order on that? Okay, in terms of the ongoing litigation, yeah, yes, the yes. other litigation? Yeah, I mean, how do you okay. put the genie back in the bottle with the litigation? Well. Let me separate this out a little bit. In terms of the, um, there's no litigation related to the settlement agreement specifically. Understood. The only litigation that Glendale was involved with at the time the settlement agreement was issued was a, an appeal pending at the Ninth Circuit that challenged, um, in which the Tonawatham Nation was challenging the constitutionality of a statute in Title IX that would have expanded the ability of the city, of a, any city to, um, to annex land when there's a trust application pending. And so they withdrew, and that's been fully briefed and argued and is awaiting decision at the Ninth Circuit. So there will be a decision issued in that case, um, regardless of anything that happens here. And, uh, and that result of that litigation wouldn't make, regardless of, of anything in this lawsuit, it wouldn't make the city of Glendale do anything. It would just mean that that statute is constitutional and cities have more authority 
with regard to annexation than they had um, before that statute was operable. And so here, we're dealing with this, um, these settlements agreement, what's so-called settlement agreement, but these actions of the city council to support and define how they're going to support the development of this casino. Um, and again, it is just a proposed casino. There is no certainty in terms of whether there will ever be class three gaming on this land. This commits the city to fronting offsite infrastructure costs, commits the city to support the Tonotham Nation on certain positions in compact negotiations in the next decade. Um, and, and these are all policy decisions that are outlined in the settlement agreement. What, what's called the settlement agreement. And again, this is not about whether there's going to be a casino or not be a casino on this land. That's not something that the city of Glendale controls. That's not something that the voters control, obviously. Um, but what this is about is about the city's relationship with this project, this proposed project, and what sort of support if any, it will provide and what it might receive in return from its new neighbor on this trust land. So these are squarely issues within the city's full discretion. This is not a situation where the city is implementing some body of law that it is charged with implementing. This is fully the legislative action where it's deciding what it's going to do with regard to this proposed casino. And, take, and what steps it's going to take within, with, within that policy of supporting that casino. So that is squarely legislative within our case law. And it doesn't matter if this is called a settlement agreement, if one of these measures is called a settlement agreement or not. Um, the city can't bypass the people's right of referendum by negotiating with a third party, whether it's a Native American tribe or whether it's a private business or an individual, if you look at the substance, not the form, and if the substance is legislative, then it's subject to referendum. It does seem troubling to me, at least, that, uh, that a settlement agreement of a lawsuit could be subject of referendum, but I think I hear you saying, don't look at that part of it, look at some other parts of it. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm saying, Your Honor, look at the whole thing yeah. in context. And again, when we describe, and this is not, the settlement agreement label here is something of a pretext. Yes, the city of Glendale agreed to drop its participation in this lawsuit challenging this annexation statute. Um, uh, but that, again, the lawsuit goes on. But that's the only litigation that they dropped out of. There's nothing in that litigation that affects the city's ob obligation, for example, to provide off-site infrastructure support for this. All, it, all that litigation addressed was whether the city would have the authority to annex land where a trust application is pending. It wouldn't even affect its authority over the land where this particular project is being built, because that land's already been taken into trust. Um, and so to call it a settlement agreement, this goes well beyond the issues in, in that case. If this was simply, we're going to drop this litigation and maybe resolving attorney's fees, you'd have um, a, a, a traditional settlement agreement because it really is settling that case. This is, this is not what that, this is. In a traditional settlement agreement, at least, you, you'd agree that's not referable. Again, I'd want to look at the substance to make sure, but if you're just resolving the issues in that case, because there may be, you know, issues that touch on legislative authority, um, in a, in a, and so you might, in some types of litigation, you might get into that, but, but, but traditional one party versus another um, breach of contract claims would not likely fall within um, within that, but that's not where we're here now. It was not on the hook in the Ninth Circuit case, the Ninth Circuit appeal, they're not on the hook in any way for attorney's fees? Is there is there no attorney's fees claim? I'm not sure there? about that, Your Honor. Um, there's the, the issue with, is that that was Tom Otham Nation's constitutional challenge to this particular I know the statute. Been hit for attorney's fees by our court before in the annexation. What, I there mean, was other a lot of blood spilt in this litigation, it seems like. I mean, a lot of cases going back and forth, but I understand that they, fees were actually awarded against them. In some other in litigation. Some litigation but, but, but all of that has nothing to do with the kinds of issues that are raised in the settlement agreement. Yes, yeah, so, what's, so what's for called, argument, let's just assume that it's not a settlement agreement. Just call it an agreement. How, how does that make a difference? How does that make it 
legislative. This document make it legislative. And, and I'd like to get real specific about what aspects of the agreement are legislative in nature. Sure. And, and whether it's a settlement agreement or an agreement, again, it's the substance of it that matters. Right, and agree. here, some of the examples that we give, and we list things on pages 14 and 15 of our brief, I think the obligation to provide infrastructure, this is really defining the city's entire relationship with this again, this project, where other, if it's a project within the city's boundaries, you might have zoning laws that you're implementing or other things that you're implementing. But here, this is defining the entire relationship, providing offsite infrastructure, a new policy to agree never to annex the nation's county island land, even if it's not in trust, um, supporting the extension of tribal state gaming compacts and specifically agreeing to take certain positions in those negotiations at the request of the Tahanawatham nation. So the, the annexation, what, the city could never do that though. Isn't that a, that's a pretty one-sided agreement. The city could never annex without the tribe's approval. They're the landowner. Under, under current state law, under current state law. And, and, um, and so they're not going to try. And even if the law became, the, the law that they had try. challenged, if the, um, state wins that, they would not exercise their authority under state law if there was an application pending. They're giving that up in this settlement agreement. Um, and so those are, those are some of the, the, hi the highlights there. And there's an exchange of funds here um, um, over, the, over the years. The city's estimate is $27 million over 20 years. That may not be right. You know, there's provisions for reductions, but that's their estimate. So there's policy here in terms of what the city's relationship is going to be with this particular project. This is really defining everything. It's like, so when I look at the cases, I think there's a spectrum. Um, on one end, you have those that don't enact anything. I think Saggio is an example where it's how do you feel about whether the city of Apache Junction should disincorporate? There's, that's just an opinion poll. Um, those aren't referable. It's not legislation. And I think some of the prior resolutions in Glendale fall within that category. Uh, we oppose Trent Frank's bill, the Keep the Promise Act. Send that to Congress. That's just, that's not enacting anything. That's an opinion poll of the city council on how they feel about this particular federal legislation. If all this was, was. About the July, the July resolution. Well, I think the July, res, two points on the July resolution. I think it fits in that same category of, because all it is is sending to Congress. It's not legislation. All it is is send, send this to Congress. This is how we feel about the casino. Now, whether it's, didn't oppose the casino or supported the casino. We've noted that there's, for some reason, the language that was approved at the city council meeting, and we included the video um, in the trial court record uh, because we discovered in the course of the proceeding an odd discrepancy where what they voted on said does not support and what was filed later with the chief, with the city clerk says we, or excuse me, does not oppose and then it says support. There was that change. So we think the accurate has to be what they voted on, what they voted on. Um, but beyond that, um, since that was, a, it was a statement of does, does not, do not oppose non-opposition to the casino. But beyond that, because all it does is um, direct them to you know send this to Congress. It's 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 in the opinion poll like the like the March resolution. It would be like in Winterstrom if instead of a bond election giving a certain amount for new roads, it would be you know public. How do you feel about spending more money for roads? It's it's that sort of um, opinion poll. That was an opinion poll of the council for how they felt about this project. Uh, this is the first time they have both you know full on support for the for the for the, for the project and also these specific steps that they are going to implement um, in light of that support so so was there so at some point in time 10 years ago then when they when somebody some council decided we are going to actively oppose this casino project we are going to litigate it we're going to we're going to go to congress we're going to was there a legislative act involved back in the day? Because it seems like the argument now is it flipped 
and therefore it's legislative. But it seems like you you ought to be able to point to a time in the past that would have been referable the, by the opposite folks, the ones who wanted the casino. Perhaps in terms of whether that 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 initial resolution was 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 referable, um, perhaps on the issue, and there it was focusing on taking the land into trust. The problem is, I mean, you ha the problem. Is, every one of these referendum cases that come up are, are not easy. I mean, <laughs> and, and the Supreme Court's acknowledged that. I think we have acknowledged that that they're, they're difficult cases because the, it's this approach, the Winterstone approach, which doesn't even seem to tightly fit here, but. Um, you know, it's just it's just an observation. It, it seems it seems difficult, and I and I guess I'll go back to the money issue. You would agree with me, I think, that just merely sp spending money is not referable, by in and of itself. Well, I mean, well, well it, doesn't the Constitution say that appropriations are not referable? Well, I'm thinking of Winterstrom again. Department. Yeah, I'm thinking of Winterstrom, where you have a bond election that approves the expenditure of thirty million dollars on roads. And that's that's referable. That's a legis that's that that was a legislative action, and of that's a, and it that's wasn't a, it was a bond election, so it wasn't a source of revenue. It's general, yeah. So that's true. It's a new source. It's that's it's a new source. A, of, that's akin to levying a tax, isn't it? I agree with that. Yes. It's different here. We're not uh, the city's not levy, levying a tax. It's it's saying here's how we're going to spend some of our money. They are getting, and they're saying we're going to take get this much money from the nation. So they are they are identifying a new revenue source, so it's to a speak. Bargain. Yeah. Well, presumably they have these funds. Or already. not? Yeah. <laughs> presumably they have these funds already because they're going to be reimbursed. Well, again, there's there's some monies in this agreement that only flow if there's class three gaming on that land, and we don't know right now, sitting here today, whether that's ever going to happen. Um, um, but but most of the money comes to the city through through that piece of of the agreement, and then there was an upfront amount paid, and and um, and then the infrastructure offsite offsite infrastructure obligation. All of those again, mo every other circumstance. I think when you look at Arizona law, um, again you have those that don't enact anything, and that's not true here. This is not just an opinion poll. There are very specific responsibilities of the city under this provision, under the under these measures. And then you look at the other extreme with the administrative, Winterstrom, um, the administrative piece implemented the bond election that prior law. Um, the conditional use permit case, Rettelsberger. There, the, the the administrative piece implemented that prior the the overarching law that governed use permits. Here, there's no overarching law that's being implemented by the city. This is fully within their discretion, which is one of the hallmarks of a a legislative act, whether it's within their discretion, and this absolutely is. If, um, it's, a, if it's a big contract. That a municipality is about to enter into it might be legislation well n n not no I don't think so your honor because most contracts they're issuing are we're going to build a highway and then you're building you're entering contracts to as part of the administrative effort you know a la Winterstrom those, um, are, those are not referable and those would not be referable it's all those are administrative steps for that to implement that initial legislative action um, about I can't. Standard development agreements, you, you know, there are a dime a dozen now, I mean, uh, but they do them for subdivisions, or they do them, they might do them. Let's say, for example, a new soccer stadium, and you do a development agreement to get, uh, say it's private, it's not publicly funded, and, and there's going to be offsite improvements, and there's going to be sales tax uh, credits back and forth. Um, referable? Not referable. I want to look this, at the specifics and lot, want to look at the law governing development agreements um, because because they explicitly said this wasn't. But I think a lot of, if you're getting into tax commitments and, and those sorts of things, I think it's hard to bypass the city and, and the people's right of referendum on those kind of measures. Uh, we cited, for example, one out of state case because there aren't many on agreements, the Strom case out of Missouri, where it's fluoridation. They tried to do that in an agreement and they're saying, no, that's a policy decision. That's a policy decision. And I see my time. Time is lapsing, so if I may, um, I'll save what little I have for rebuttal. Thank you.
Good morning. Keith Beecham. I'm representing Pam Hanna and the city of Glendale. Uh, with me is my co-counsel, Rupali Desai. Um, I think that the last, um, really maybe the second to last colloquy between Judge Brown uh, and Ms. O'Grady, um, I think it hits the, the nail on the head here. Um, Ms. O'Grady said something to the effect of there's no art overarching law being enacted by the city, uh, and that's why they have full discretion here. And, and it kind of ties back to one of the uh, early questions you asked Judge Brown, which was, uh, was there a referable decision by the city? And the reality is there isn't. That's the whole point here. This, this isn't city land. And the decisions about what's going to happen on that piece of property are not the city's to make. But it's a big deal to many of the citizens whether there's going to be a casino next door. It, it is a big deal to the citizens, and there are other governmental entities to which those citizens can communicate about what happens on that piece of property, but it's not the city because the city has no control over it. And to, to really get to your question, um, Judge, Judge Brown, um, there was not an earlier decision because it, it wasn't the city's to make. And so typically uh, the zoning cases are, there are a number of those obviously, um, and in the zoning cases, when the zoning act occurs, when the city decides what it's going to do with the property, um, that's the, and how they're going to affect the property rights, that's what's typically referable. And the courts sometimes decide whether the big zoning plan is what's referable, because does it have enough implementation in it or not, or is it some subsequent conditional use permit or something else? Is that the, the real important event? And here we don't have that event, and the reason we don't have it is because it's not city property. And that is, I believe, why the trial court was correct in its ruling. There is nothing for the voters to vote on here any, any more than there was anything legislated for the city council to do, because what happens with that piece of property is not within the control of the city council. But don't get the voters get to to the extent, uh, however the vote may show up, to, to spend money up into the, to the edge of the property as a result of the settlement agreement? Uh, no, Your Honor. Those, that, the, what is happening in this settlement agreement here is typically not a referable event. It's an administrative action. There is someone that's developing these pieces of property. The city can't control what they do with it, which is a little unusual, but that's the way it is. It, it sounds like a lot like a development agreement. I know it says, I mean, I know you well, take the position it's not a development agreement, but well, let me ask you the, sort of the threshold question. Is it is a development agreement referable I think in, typically, in Arizona? I think typically development agreements are not referable. Um, they are, they flow from the legislative enactment, which typically is the zoning. How, how are we, what are we going to do with a piece of property? And then you decide the nuances of who's going to pay for it and how. And the nuance piece, the development agreement piece, is not referable. I don't believe there are, I don't, I'm, I don't believe there's a single reported, I'm not, I'm not aware of an unreported one either, Arizona case saying a development agreement is a referable action. And, and tip, I'm. No, it just seems like here where, and, and going back to your, your comment right at the, at the beginning is you had years of intense litigation, lots of attorney's fees. The citizens are watching that and observing and seeing what's going on. And maybe there was never any moment in time when there was a referable act to actually start that, that process. But is there at some point where it becomes such a sea change of a, such a changing course as of what happened last year. Is that such a sea change? I mean, why shouldn't the voters be able to say, time out, we, we've relied upon this litigation, we, we've invested in this litigation, the city council has invested our, our funds in this opposition. Now it's a change, that is a new policy. It, it, because it's not, a, it's not a new policy for the city. The city's efforts to have control over the piece of property were unsuccessful. And, and it wasn't because the city council voted on it. It's because the courts, um, principally the federal courts, and a variety of decisions said, no, city, you can't do this, that, or the other thing. We've walked through the annexation decisions and whatnot. And so the city, as of the time it made this agreement, did not have the ability and had not for some time, despite its efforts, to exercise control over the piece of property. And because if, of that, the city was, was... If it was exercising more control and somehow in combination with the other features that we do have here, then it, then it would be referable under your analysis? I, I don't believe this agreement itself would be referable, but I think that there would have been an agreement that preceded this settlement agreement, or it's not a development agreement, but if there were to be a development agreement, there would have been an agreement, and it probably would have been a zoning agreement. It might have been something else. But there isn't one of those decisions. 
uh, because the city can't can't impose one because it's not the city's property. It's not it's not in city not city land. Um, the I'm, comment for a moment on the settlement agreement since we're talking about it. I want to be clear. Um, there I think were some. Um, ships passing in the night in the briefing, uh, and I'd urge you to just look at the settlement agreement if you haven't already. Um, the settlement agreement does what the city would typically do late in the process, and what the city's done here typically is not referable. I don't think that, um, that they can point you to a single case where these kind of events are deemed to be referable, because what the city has done is said, okay, you, I'm summarizing, but you, um, property owner, are going to be responsible for all the costs within the piece of property. You're going to be responsible for your own fire service and other governmental services within the piece of property. And here's what we're going to do with respect to roads and water and things like that. It, it's not a referable decision to the, to the voters. And those, to pick up on your question earlier about the process, um, those events are underway. Um, I, just know from reading the newspaper that they had the topping off ceremony in March for the building. Maybe it's maybe there's going to be gaming there. Maybe there isn't. Um, but but the process is underway and the infrastructure expenditure is underway, and that is why I think at the root this is a settlement agreement and why I think your instincts of um, of what what happens in the litigation if the voters disapprove this are spot on because the city is spending money and the city is, has received money and the city has dismissed itself from litigation in reliance on the settlement agreement. And but has the city done so at a risk? No, no, Your yeah. Honor, I don't believe so. I think the city's entirely um, entitled to rely upon, um, I think, settled law in doing that. And the, um, what the city has done here is what cities, with all respect, always do. There, there just aren't, despite, um, a really an outstanding job on the briefs by, by Ms. O'Grady, there just are not cases like this one where these kind of events, where um, a city says, here's what we're going to do about the, um, how the road is going to approach your property, where those are deemed to be referable. They're just not. What's unusual about this one is the city was able to negotiate a deal to get the land over to, to pay for some of it. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But it's not a referable event. It's administrative. And if, if this settlement agreement um, is referable, then um, other agreements like it will be deemed to be referable, and, and the efficient administration of cities will grind to a halt. Cities have to be able to enter into agreements and not wait three years to decide whether ultimately a court of appeals is going to agree with a trial court um, about whether, they, uh, whether the voters can approve that or not. Um, it, it just wouldn't permit cities to function efficiently, which is why there are the limitations that are well established in the Constitution and in the cases construing it um, on this kind of activity. What's your or explain, explain to me your position on the on the Kansas case. The, the, I think that's an interesting case on the fluoride in the in the water. The, the, because that is a very different case. The the folks in Kansas, unlike the city of Glendale, um, the city council in Kansas has the ability to put fluoride in the water or not. And when they make that decision, that is the kind of thing that perhaps voter that is deemed to be legislative and voters can opine on. Um, it's not like the situation here, where we are not, the city does not have authority to decide whether to um, permit gaming or to really have any say whatsoever in what gets constructed on that piece of property. And so what you're left with is when you, because they concede as they must, that this, whatever happens with a casino is going to happen without regard to the city of Glendale. I think that's um, an important concession. And so what you're left with is trying to analogize putting fluoride in your water and for the entire city of Kansas City uh, without letting the voters know about it versus how we're, what we're going to do with getting water to a piece of property and how we're going to align a street to a piece of property. They are not the same thing. And, and they're very, very different things. And I don't disagree with the concept that you might label something a settlement and have it be something other, as, other than a settlement, and therefore it's a sham. There's zero evidence in the record that this is a sham. The city litigated, the city lost uh, a lot of money and a lot of fights along the way. And the agreement that the city reached, this litigation was about what to do with this piece of property, and the agreement the city reached ultimately, uh, when you strip out the the clearly opinion poll pieces that don't matter, the pieces about let's support a gaming compact and let's urge the feds to do one thing or another, which I think everyone now agrees is, is not something that's referable. When you strip all that out, what you're left with is who's going to pay, how are we going to get the water to your property, how are the roads going to be? That's all you're left with, and that's not a referable decision. Did you think that the July 2014 referendum was referable? 
Um, I would say no, Your Honor. Um, in, in my view, for the, I think if I said that, it, I wouldn't be consistent with what I've been saying throughout this argument. So I think no. Uh, reasonable minds might differ about that, but, but I would say no, Your Honor. Um, because I, I just don't think the city has the ability to effectuate the kind of things that would be deemed legislative. Does, does the July 2014 have any significant bearing on what we decide about the August decisions? No, sir, I don't believe so. I mean, I think that's a, a, I think the July issue is essentially a red herring um, mm. up and down. So, um, I've, the, the city, I'd like to turn for a second if you, um, to the other issue that uh, was raised in the opening brief regarding authority of the city of city clerk to reject petitions. As I read the statutes in Title 19, there's a lot of shalls in there. So help me understand why, how the city clerk has the discretion, if you will, to um, make a legal determination. Uh, I guess the question would be why not, why not just have the city clerk process the application, let the chips fall where they may if somebody wants to bring litigation then so be it is why why isn't that a valid approach the, the the statutes essentially direct the clerk uh not to refer matters or to reject petitions on certain grounds and is silent as to other issues um, the constitution provides um, what is referable and what is not and that statute does not limit what the constitution provides and i don't think that's unusual and in fact city clerks around the state and courts in in the, in the state for literally decades have construed the city's clerk's authority to reach to rejecting um, petitions and whether they be initiative or referenda on uh, grounds that they don't satisfy the constitutional requirements and as we explained in our papers th that's really the appropriate it's, it's worked pretty well and it's really the appropriate um, way to approach things for a couple of reasons. First of all, there may be no one who actually um, marshals the resources. We're here on the city's nickel, um, but there might not be anyone else here raising the question of whether the um, whether this is referable or not. Secondly, the city is the one that bears the expense. Um, holding elections is not um, inexpensive and it is uh, a, a demand on people's time. And ultimately, if you permit there to be a boundless referendum, which I submit would be the case if city clerks stopped exercising the function they've been exercising for decades, you would have many, many opinion polls. Um, we're sitting here today with, um, with council agreeing that some of these things, like the support for um, a, a federal bill, is not referable. I think everyone in this room agrees that. Um, but and, but and, this, it may never get to this room if the clerk's not permitted to say, we're not doing that. And is it true, it's true, is it not, that if, the, if sufficient petitions are certified, to the uh, county recorder, then the then the legis then the legislation at issue is placed on hold. If if a sufficient number of petitions are sent, I didn't. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, yes. Or for or actually, if if the the group, regardless of whether it's administrative, le legislative, if the group oh. gathers sufficient petitions and those are actually forwarded to the county recorder for certification, then the legislation cannot go forward. It, that typically, it does not go into effect. That typically is what happens. Cities and it typically do not want to proceed when there's going to be election about um, whether the zoning is permissible and developers don't want to spend the money, et cetera, um, until that issue gets resolved. And so it would, while all this is happening, cause things to grind to a halt. And I, and I really can't um, overemphasize the notion that it, it would be um, bad policy and really bad for democracy if there are 20 measures on a city ballot that don't really make any sense because this, the, because the, their opinion polls and the clerk is not permitted uh, to reject them for reasons that seem fairly plain on their face. And that's different than deciding the preemption issue. Um, you know, there are, there are instances where, um, where it's, it's not appropriate for the clerk to make those decisions, but because the constitution itself says that voters only have the authority um, for referendum on matters that that they have the authority to enact just like the city council it's entirely appropriate for the clerk to do that and and that's why clerks have been doing it for decades and there's no decision i'm aware of saying they ought to do something different um, i'm winding down with time and i've covered i think the matters i wanted to um 
I wanted to address. I, I guess I'll close in saying that the limitations on referendum power exist for good reason. Um, and this is a, a pretty good case, but you can easily imagine ones that would be um, even more problematic than this one, where um, if those powers were not exercised um, by the clerk and ultimately by this court, that the cities could not operate efficiently. And here, the city has no authority to decide what's going to happen on this piece of property. And, and in fact, there may not be gaming on this piece of property, but it's not the city's decision to make. And there was never a, the fundamental legislative piece that, um, that would be necessary to permit this to go to the voters because it's not the city's call to make. And the, unless you gentlemen have any questions, I think I've covered what I wanted to. I was going to, well, and I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, uh, we think we're probably going to re remove the Rule 29 basis, but still move to get this resolved fairly quickly because uh, regardless if this goes upstairs to the Supreme Court, you'd like that resolve prior to any uh, election in the fall of 2016? We, we, we certainly don't have any objection to that. We didn't, you know, we, that, that's fine by us, fine by the city. Thank you. Well, yeah, I don't know necessarily know that we want to resolve this in three days. But yeah, well, so, for all that again, sooner is better, and sooner. that's especially true in this case, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, a few points. The emphasis on the fact that the city has no control over this land doesn't determine whether this is legislative or not. This is really the city is doing, the city is making a policy call as to what it wants to do with regard to this development. And in every other circumstance where it's in the city's boundaries, there's an other, there are other overlays of laws that you know, govern that development when it gets down to this administrative level of, exec of executing agreements. So like with um, development agreements, there's a bunch of law that govern that, and the specifics are then implementation of those general laws. That is not the case here. This is fully an exercise of the city's discretion making the policy call as to what it wants to do with regard to this development. It is not going to grind anything to a halt within uh, as, as Council for Glendale suggests, because this is a rather unique agreement where they are really outside any sort of state law um, or local ordinance in terms of making it up on their own as to what they want to do um, with regard to this. Um, and and it be, is... Would, would it be different if Glendale had come to a similar agreement with the Cardinals, for example? With um, about a settlement, and they were going to do hookups and uh, and you know, give the uh, the cardinals around the stadium some benefits that uh, an ordinary developer wouldn't get. Yeah, I think that would be different because there you had this separate um, state law and state body. Uh, it used to be called the Tourism and Sports Authority. I forget what it's called now. But that they're making the decision on the siting of that facility. And so anything else that happens at the local level, I think, would be administrative decisions administering that policy decision that was made by that separate state body. Uh, and again, that's what you have in every other circumstance that I've read in the case where, oops, where, I see I'm out of time. Keep answering. Um, where you have uh, some state law that's being implemented, and that's simply not the case here. Good question. Question? Or do you want to ask your timing question? Uh, your position with respect to us removing the Rule 29 but otherwise expediting our decision? That's fine, Your Honor. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We appreciate the argument of counsel. It has uh, been helpful. Uh, we will take this matter under advisement and issue our written ruling uh, in, uh, in due course. We, in fact, are ordering and we'll issue a separate order uh, removing the Rule 29 marker, uh, but we stand adjourned. Thank you.